Good evening. I was not aware we were starting on time today. Usually we start nine, uh, quarter past, but um, since we're so full house, let's get started. Uh, welcome to our second talk here tonight uh, in the Istanbul 95 uh, series. It's a great pleasure for us to have Alka here, uh, Alka Blitz from uh, Amsterdam. Uh, we're very curious to see what you will show you uh, show us here tonight. Uh, but being from Istanbul, I'm sure you know some of the work that uh, Alka have done in this city. But I will leave the floor to you, Alka, and looking forward to here. Okay. Thank you for your kind introduction. It's uh, actually a great honor for me to be here. Um, first time ever that I'm simultaneously going to be translated by someone. Thank you. I've never had that before. Only people repeating my words. Um, Istanbul. I'm from Amsterdam. Amsterdam is a village compared to Istanbul. That really intrigues me. Uh, I was thinking, what am I going to tell you, actually? Uh, what can I bring for you? Uh, because I don't know anything about Istanbul, or hardly. Uh, so I thought it would be good to actually tell you about what intrigues me, what I find important. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, you like it. Uh, first, a small introduction, because um, CARF is uh, the design studio I founded 20 years ago. Uh, but uh, CARF is not only me, CARF is a whole bunch of people, and without them, I'm nothing. That's how simple it is. Uh, these are not the actual people yet, because I didn't have a newer picture. That gives you an idea. Um, but this is how we still like to see each other, children playing around, because designing is actually also a kind of play. We play with the stuff that we have, and we uh, shape that into a design, and we try to keep this uh, childhood uh, way of looking at a uh, childish, not not childish, but like, uh, looking at it as a child. Um, we work all over the world, uh, which is very very nice, but it also means a lot of traveling, and uh, it's very strange to come in other areas where you have no idea about the culture and they expect you to tell you something. I always feel a little bit strange then, because what shall I tell actually? Um, just a few products that we have done over time to get you an idea. Maybe you have seen part of our work, maybe you haven't. Um, uh, quickly, the one in the left corner is a museum area. The, the second one is in Singapore. You will probably recognize the right lower and co low corner, which is the Soil Center uh, here in Istanbul. Um, many different projects. So now we are going to the real subject. Uh, what does play mean? Uh, people have lots of uh, descriptions for play, but this is uh, how I look at it and what I have learned over time. Uh, first of all, play is the base of all culture. Now we're playing at this moment. You're listening, I'm telling, there's a kind of a role play. Um, this was, uh, there is a famous book of Johan Huysinga, a Dutch historian, that wrote the book Homo Ludens. It's all about play. Um, play is everything that comes after mankind's need. If you have slept, if you have eaten, if you have a roof over your head, all the rest can be considered play. Uh, this is an image of Aldo van Eyck, who used play actually to have people meet in the city. Now, what can a playground mean? Because we are designing play playgrounds. Uh, I wouldn't mind if it's a little bit lower. Can everybody hear me very well? Okay. Um, what can a playground mean? What can it contribute actually to a place? Um, well, first of all, it should evoke play. That's kind of obvious, because otherwise it's not a playground. Um, then we should be able to give identity to a place, because if I look at playgrounds, they're all the same. They're all the same houses. You're not saying, I, uh, I meet you at the playground there, but here you meet at the blue square. You know actually where you are, sense of place. That is something that a playground can do for a neighborhood. Could it be a sculpture? I don't know. Why should it actually be the equipment that we know? It should actually uh, give the option for a non-directive way of using. Um, or could it even cater for the unexpected? Something that we didn't design, 
But on this one hot day out of the year in the Netherlands, because usually it's very cold, uh, people just filled it up and it became something else. That is actually what... I cannot design this. This is a surprise for me as well. And this is a very old project and I still like it up to today. Um, because this is what people do with the design that we... Uh, the play design that we make. Um, a brief history. Um, because what we do, there's nothing new about what we do. Um, I found this picture of Kuro Kaneko. Uh, this is from 1935 in Japan. Uh, even for today's standard, this is a very, very exciting, uh, different playground. Uh, Noguchi, uh, famous artist, uh, actually he wanted to give um, um, oh, I'm a little bit fast. He wanted to give some sort of a social meaning to a sculpture, and that's how he got into designing playgrounds. And uh, we are still learning from that today. Uh, but again, there's nothing new. This is design. I can tell you lots about it. But we have seen what other people already have done in the 20th century. Uh, or in the Zorlu Center, learning from uh, Kuro Kaneko. Um, Actually, I didn't know about the Japanese slide before, but uh, there's nothing new in this world. And that is actually very interesting. Every time we reinvent play for certain spaces. But what happened? Before the 80s of last century, many playgrounds were actually being designed or developed by artists, by architects, by uh, local initiatives. We wanted to do something. But suddenly the world, or I should say the commercial world, took over. Safety became a big issue, which is of course a big issue, but it resulted in this kind of playgrounds you're probably all familiar with. Um, for me they're not very attractive, although um, children might think about that in a different way. Uh, and then we even invented a natural play. We make wooden playgrounds. This is probably not the nicest example. There is nothing natural about this as there is natural about that. Um, it's the same house, actually. Um, the natural play should be playing in nature and not with uh, a swing made out of uh, a natural material. Um, and then my question is, isn't all play natural by nature? Uh, it doesn't matter where you play, it is about how you play. And that can be in a green environment. And this is a bad image, but it's, uh, sorry for that. But this is the one after it. This is a completely artificial uh, environment, but it's the same type of play. So we should actually look at it uh, from a broader perspective. See what can you do with it, rather than what does it look like. Which is strange saying so, because I'm a designer. Um, another thing that I wanted to address is uh, we're always talking about all-inclusive. Everybody is invited. If you're in a wheelchair, you should be able to get there, which is also a good thing. But uh, this is what we built for impaired uh, children. To me, it looks like torture instruments. Uh, I found this on a website. They were actually um, saying, look at this playground, how great is it? We built this as all-inclusive playground. Uh, there are no children there, but I don't see how it works either. Um, and what does that mean, all-inclusive? Because we're talking about wheelchair people, are we talking also about mentally impaired, physically impaired, socially handicapped, autistic children? We always forget about it, we think about wheelchairs. Um, so my question would be, should play focus on disabilities or capabilities? And I'm showing you this image because it's a playground actually built around a ramp. But nobody actually recognizes this as a playground for disabled. And that is the main quality of it. Um, so should it look like that? This is also built around a toolkit for disabled children. They can actually reach practically everything on the wheelchair uh, only for the last bit they have to get out. Um, visually impaired, <coughs> they can actually use the playground very, very well, but we never have these signs so that they can learn how it works, develop, uh, discover on forehand how you can use this playground. And um, 
to be honest, this boy is not impaired, but do we know? We have no idea. Um, because it's actually the son of my uh, companion in the company. But I just want people to look at it. We have no idea. We don't know. We, we have no idea what impaired. We are all impaired in a way. Um, then another thing, why should playgrounds have lots of color? Very nice colors, cotton candy-like, everybody likes it. Or, I hope we all agree this is not such a nice color scheme. Or maybe the ugly, probably we don't even want to have this around the corner. Although I think it's very nicely done and they nicely stay within the shape of the skate park. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see, but this is actually all black with a hint of color. And this is one time we did an all black playground. And um, children won't mind. They just see a playground. They're totally not interested in the color schemes that we all think of. And actually, what they did, they used it as a blackboard. One of these other things we tried to, or I wish I could incorporate in the design of, uh, beforehand, but I cannot. They, they just did this, and this is great. So, then can play be a catalyst? And with can play be a catalyst, I mean, can it be a, a catalyst for a certain space in a city or in a village or maybe even uh, uh, in a park? And uh, I chose this image of a mine site in Belgium um, where they actually use this to attract tourists. It's a playground. The question was, can you build a playground? But it's meant to get tourists back into the area because the mine is closed. There needs to be a little bit more commercial activity. Uh, and people look at it and ask, what is it for? I don't know, but can you play on it? Yes, certainly you can play on it. Take a look at it. Um, and uh, it's a very steep climb. Everybody wants to get up. I can tell you, if you're in front of it, you want to get up. Um, over here, there's also what we call a stairway to heaven. All grown-ups are using this playground. If we say it's a playground, they are probably a little bit scared off, but if they look at it, they are all, if, uh, they're all willing to try to see how they can get up. And I call it a monument for camaraderie because all people that used to work in the mine before, that don't see each other anymore, go there with their children and they talk to each other and they meet each other again. Um, well, I can go on like this, but it's uh, quite clear what we mean. Um, can history repeat itself? Um, let me further explain. In the beginning of the 19th, 20th century, there was this health uh, and uh, yeah, health movement, I should say. People should get outside, should exercise, should uh, be in the open air, the building should have uh, large windows, etc., etc. And in Amsterdam, in the layout of Amsterdam, uh, from that time, that is uh, the beginning of the 20th century, they had the urban layout and they kept open spaces for playgrounds. And this is seriously in 1908. It was an open field with swings and seesaws. Um, that really became the place to be to go to with, for all families, with kids, but also for grandparents, for everyone. And they had an organization there, a playground association that uh, maintained the equipment, but there was also a social hub. Uh, people gathered there, people met there. Um, but then something happened. The city was taken over by cars. And in the meantime, I need to express that the organization of these playground uh, foundations collapsed. People didn't want to do that anymore. And 30 years later, we have solved the problem a little bit of the cars. They are nicely parked, but uh, still there uh, is... I actually need to explain, sorry. Um, oh, sorry. 
this street here, there's hardly any cars there. Here you have more, and here actually the whole playground has disappeared because it's surrounded by cars. And the children that live here actually cannot really easily reach the playground anymore. And then the next step in Amsterdam, because this is in Amsterdam, was taking out the cars and put them under the ground. And now the buildings are again connected to this playground again. The, the, the playground is actually here. It's all the same space we're talking about. And this is what it looks like today. It is an area that is completely renewed and used for play, sports, etc. But it's also a commercial space because there is a little coffee shop. And that is the new neighborhood. This is taken over from the playground foundation. So we've tried to find new ways to solve the same problem. That's actually what I want to express here. So, um, I've called this steps. Strategies to enhance play spaces in urban um, uh, areas. And what can we do? I recently have been working together with Urham Urban Design uh, for the city of Amsterdam on a book called The Active City. And The Active City was all about strategies, about how can we make the city more interesting. And actually, this is where I wanted to go with my previous story. Um, because we can think about nice playgrounds, we can think about nice sports facilities, but how can we actually use play and sports to keep the city active and interesting and attractive to live in? Because that is actually the question behind it, or that is a question behind it for me. And uh, there were many contributors to this book, and of course I contributed to the part of play. Um, and this is the new manifest for the city of Amsterdam. And I chose this to tell you uh, a little bit more about this because actually this is where I see the relation with Istanbul, except for probably the problems that Istanbul faces are much bigger than Amsterdam. Not only from the size, but also from the importance of having a car. Because the active city is a city that is a healthy city. And this refers back to the playground movement in the 20th century again. And, and I've chosen two projects actually to tell my story. Uh, one, this project um, you saw in the previous picture is called uh, Van Beuningen Plein, and that is the first one. And um, in short, this is the new active city. How can we get cars out of the street? How can we make people move in buildings? How can we let children play? How can they reach their playground? How can we cycle to school? How can children cycle to school? How can we have small sports hub near your house? Lots of things um, are addressed in this book. And for me, sports and play, although sports is probably for a different age group, don't differ that much. You've got recreational sports, I used to be a skateboarder. Is that playing? Is that sport? I don't know. Um, first of all, and you've probably all seen this, um, and this is a little mistake in my presentation here. It's the importance of spatial justice. I'm not telling you anything new. And this is about how much hours per day should children actually have physical activity, adult and uh, older people, because that is really important. They need to do that to stay healthy. Uh, but where can they do that? These were the two main um, issues that we uh, discussed in the book from certain perspectives. And from my perspective, that was uh, play. Okay, cycling and walking, main activities. I know that Gregor is from Copenhagen, he will recognize this, although these are tourists on a bicycle but your green spaces are being used as activity spaces these days. Um, so people already do this. Uh, they invent things in the city to play and uh, have activities like parkour or free running. Um, 
what we are doing at the moment in Amsterdam is having sports facilities being opened up. Um, if you take a good look, there's no fence around it. This is just a public um, running track. So you need to have open facilities, not closed off facilities. If, um, an example case of an active space. And I start with a park, and this is an old project, and uh, this is a project that has been very important for me uh, because it's a long time ago, and uh, it took quite a while to uh, achieve this, but actually it already addresses the elements I've just discussed, open spaces. Um, here we go to design tools for, for sports, and it's about shared sports facilities and big sports facilities and open structures. Amsterdam, this is Amsterdam, is a city that is built like an onion. This is the old city. And we've got the first layout. Then we've got the after Second World War layout. And this is mainly um, uh, after 2060. This circle is our periphery. And we are discussing this part here. This is a big green area within the periphery. One of the parts of the city that is prone to fall in, a, in the hands of developers for building, actually giving up this space um, to, uh, for new buildings um, instead of keeping it green. And it's very important for all of us. You notice that I'm not specifically talking about play, but this is all about play as well, we play. Um, it's very important to keep these open spaces in your periphery within, uh, in, instead of building them. So you have to go outside in your car to go to a park, to go to a playground. Um, this is the area. It was an old sport complex for um, every, anyone who is into soccer. This was the old former Ajax um, soccer stadium site. Um, and this is what it looked like. This was an abandoned area. People only used it to go from A to B and not after 10 o'clock because you didn't feel secure anymore. And our question actually was, can you build a playground here? If you build a playground there, probably it's becoming an attractive space. And then we started thinking and said, hmm, I don't know, uh, having a playground somewhere in the middle where people don't want to go, that's not making, that is not going to be an attractive sp uh, space. So what we did actually is, um, this is the whole sports facility, we discussed with the municipality to see if they were willing to take out all fences, make it public sports facilities. So that there was a new 24-7 um, activity going on in the, on this facility rather than going at 4 o'clock to your training for soccer. Um, and then they suddenly turned out plans of 10 years ago that they had discussed that. And they said, maybe we should do this. So what we did is we took out, first we took out all fencing of this area. And then we developed only this part and we said all the areas in between the sports facilities is actually already park. You can run around freely, there's no cars. You can make use of it uh, the way you want. You can use the soccer uh, or the sport court facilities. And even the organizations that were already there benefited from it because suddenly there was much more activity going on. Um, then the only thing we actually did physically is building this playground. This is a strip in the middle, and our only intervention was this part and the strip here, making it green again and making a large playground. And this is what it looks like today. Um, this has a park-like character. Everywhere is explained how, the, how it works, that you can make use of everything, so we actually turned it into the largest playground that you can think of. Um, the center section, um, families like to go somewhere and bring their lunch and, and play. Uh, of course, there is the, the playground. 
interesting to mention is that is this is actually a part of the water system of Amsterdam that we turned into a water playground. Um, uh, so from here you can actually go to the sports facility and, and go back again. Um, this needs no further explanation. Um, what we find important, important in playgrounds, and this is the hub of this particular area, is blending functions. Um, because we don't believe in making playgrounds that are separated parts, two to four, four to six, six to eight, eight to 12. Uh, can you tell if someone of five years old has the motor skills to run up that hill? And uh, does that also mean that another one of five year old has the same motor skills? Playing is about discover, uh, to, to, to uh, discover what you are capable of, rather than saying this is for you, you cannot do that. Um, then we put in, and this is another thing uh, for playgrounds, we put in something very specific that is actually not for children for playing, is a professional boulder climbing wall. Uh, but we had a reason for doing that, because it brings in a certain group of people to this area that if you remember, I said it was an abandoned area. Now we bring in a dedicated group of professional climbers that are going to use this. And um, here they're using it, but please take a look at this. This little boy here is playing and is actually seeing what these grown-ups are doing there. And he's going to ask, what are you doing there? Can you teach me, etc. So we're actually creating a sort of a community on this playground. Uh, where this particular boulder wall wasn't meant for children. Um, um, and we learned that actually by mixing these things, you get the most interesting spaces for playing. Um, if I tell you a little anecdote about this, if you put a child in front of a climbing wall, it either can climb up and say, it's stupid, I can climb up, or it cannot climb up and it says, it's stupid, I cannot climb up, it's too difficult. This wall is really as tens of different routes on it, but they just see how it's being used by the professional bowlers. They ask, they teach them, then they try to do it themselves. Uh, and this has become a very, very lively part of this uh, sports facility, only because we put a playground in the middle. And again, I'm not emphasizing on the playground itself, but that has all the elements you can expect in the playground as well. Again, we use play as a catalyst for a space and to activate a space and to turn it or maybe even bind it together because everybody that goes there with his kids talks to someone else with kids. Uh, and that is probably uh, more important than anything else. Then the Van Beuningen plan. That was another part that is being addressed in the book. Um, again, places without borders and a small square in uh, a pre-war layout. That means uh, houses for, uh, I cannot really say, but let's say the working class. They had new social housing there. They had this playground there. And uh, all these areas in Amsterdam uh, gentrify rapidly um, and are being refurbished, renewed, uh, including the playground. But what should you do on a playground? Because if you participate, are we going to have a ball court? Are we going to have a playground? Are we going to have a slide? Are we going to have a skate park? Are we going to have a splash pad with water? It's only a small square and it should cater for the whole neighborhood. And we always think of elements that we should incorporate in the playground where we think there are better strategies. Um, just quickly, uh, this, this is the square. This was the old playground. We have seen it before it developed in the 80s into a sort of a abandoned place actually. Here was the, the, the, the basketball court. Here was the sand pit. Here was the clubhouse. Um, and then we tried to think of a plan, and I didn't do this on my own, I did this together with, uh, for the building concrete architects and for the uh, landscaping from Dijk Co. landscape architects. 
we took out the streets. Uh, so all houses around it are connected to the square again. That is already very important. So you can move because it's very important for children that they can go somewhere safe. They shouldn't be brought out there by a car. They should just run out their house and go to the playground. That is very important. You don't see that anymore. When I came to Istanbul today, I was uh, sitting in the taxi, uh, not a taxi, a car, and I see the new coastal development, and there's plenty of playgrounds there. But as, when you are a child, you cannot reach those playgrounds. Your parents have to bring you there. And then you can play for an hour, and then we all go to the restaurant or somewhere else. Importance of play in a city is places that are dedicated for play, where everybody is welcome, and that you can reach when you're six year old, that your parents still believe that you uh, can go there on your own and feel safe, not being hit by a car. Um, and why shouldn't we combine sports and play? Why should a playground, and this is uh, part of that strategy, why shouldn't it be a, a water playground or a, a panna field or a basketball court in the same time? Because we only have this small square and we didn't want to make choices. And of course, this is not the best basketball court that you can think of or the best water playground that you can think of, but it has it all on this very small space. Um, again, as said about the sports facilities, borderless spaces. This is the playground, but you can sit there and it has a tree there. What I mean is, it's, it's, you want to? Yeah, sure. I come to that later, but it is a good question. That is, uh, of, of course we do, but we can elaborate on that a little bit more. Um, actually, we think this is very nice because you want to be not sitting on this formal bench here. You want to be part of the playing of your kids. And look at this, she's bringing her baby and uh, daddy is watching and somebody is passing through. It should be an environment and it's up to you how you use it. Um, and we also made these transitional areas around the sports facilities because um, it can be used for skating, it can be used for uh, uh, on a BMX bike, uh, it all, there is no um, rigid border. Of course this is the soccer field, but if you want to go skate, go skate on, on, on the edges here. Um, we try to, and I showed this image before, design playgrounds that don't tell you this is for this is not a spring rider for two years old um, actually in the morning oh oh I'm going way too fast now in the morning you will find toddlers here because for them there are little uh, hammock swings um, at the end of the day you will find uh, very often girls actually sitting there that are 12 years old they talk to each other and they uh, play with their phones. Um, so it can change over the day. Why should it be a spring rider and this place for girls where they can sit or for boys where they can do whatever? Uh, it can be everything. It depends on the user. So what we try to do is we try to almost design um, age independent. It's on the user. Uh, uh, or the user defines what it will be. Um, that is also actually raising questions because sometimes people ask, what is it for? Um, another thing, is the playground for children or for parents or is it for families? Actually, it's for all. Um, again, if I take a look at, at most conventional playgrounds, what I see is um, equipment and then there is benches around it. But actually, this is designed in a way that you're almost invited to run over. Nobody can tell you you're not allowed to run over because is it, is it a bench? Is it a table? Is it a playground? 
uh, we have no idea. That also depends on the users. It's obvious, obviously that all parents are sitting here and watching the playground, uh, but you can also have a lunch there. Uh, you see what happens, children are pl uh, uh, climbing the trees. And we purposely try to design in a way that it doesn't look like a playground. Because if it does, you can play there and you're not allowed to use the other part anymore because that is meant for, for, uh, as a, uh, for sitting or that is meant for uh, playing basketball. So we try to have all these functions overlap in obstacles that are not quite obvious what they really are. Um, For me, this is all clear. It doesn't need any further <laughs> explanation. And again, is it for skating? Is it to sit? You'll have to find out. And the whole deer, uh, deer is uh, uh, about it, having a playground for all ages, and then I mean 2 to 88. Somebody then asked me, should you put up a sign? Uh, are you not allowed when you're 89? No, everybody's invited. It's 24-7. It's on the user groups, how they use it, how they make use of it. And honestly, Monday morning, 10 o'clock, would you expect many skateboarders or BMXers coming in? No, they're on school. Toddlers go there with the parents with buggies. And uh, believe me, uh, oh, I'm using the wrong button. They also used it on the, on the little trikes. They also uh, go around it. It's not... But you also know that someone on the skateboard will use it differently. Um, I guess this guy just did some shopping and he started now and is looking how people actively behave on this square and how they do that. So again, uh, for us, these edges here are very playful and we don't think in designing in um, certain activities but almost in affordances. In it is what you see in it and how you can use this. Um, and then I'm going to be ahead of the question, is this um, giving problems? Because you have different user groups that might come in there on the same time. Um, well, we discovered that it takes a couple of weeks, but then they all know exactly in this neighborhood how it works. Sunday afternoon, four o'clock, this guy uh, and his friends, I just make this up, play basketball. So this, the, the, the people that play football come at a different time slot. Um, skateboarders usually stay behind this uh, ball catcher because there's another block of concrete that they can use. Um, again, nobody that is playing basketball bothers about this child that is uh, uh, having fun with this water jet. And uh, the whole neighborhood can use it for other activities as well. Why should it be all filled in and squared off and be exact? Um, although this is a little bit of a cheat because this was at the opening. It was only to explain <laughs> that you can use these spaces for much more. And believe me, the size of this is three small basketball courts. And you have a playground for children. You have a soccer court. You have small football courts, a foot, football uh, or a panna court. You have skate facilities. Uh, you have water facilities. There's a clubhouse. There's a coffee shop. There's tables. There is a stage. Uh, but there is no defined border. It's up to you how you would like to use this. Um, again, and this brings me back to the history. Is this the new playground or is this the new neighborhood hub where you meet your friends, where you meet with other people that have, uh, uh, do have kids, where you meet with different age groups? Um, well, I don't know, but um, after 20 years, we're still questioning play. That was my uh, story for today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elke. That was amazing. Uh, I think before we open to the to the room, I'm sure there will be plenty of questions. And I'm getting a noise from there. Um, I have one question. Um, um, how do you get to there? Let's say we talked before the lecture starts. Um, do you do workshops with the neighborhoods? 
or have you gained so much experience over now that you, let's say, have a menu of things? Or I mean, because we, of course, uh, part of this is also to engage our community. I wish it was that easy, because it's always it's always a different story. Um, and now I have the uh, had the time to think uh, it uh, think about it a little bit more. For this particular um, area, it, uh, there were many workshops, including workshop with disabled, because you can reach all soccer courts again with your wheelchair. Um, the thing here is that in this area of Amsterdam, people loved it to have their cars being parked on the ground. Although, of course, there was a group of people that didn't want to have a uh, building place in front of the house uh, for two years, uh, but everybody saw that it was needed uh, in the renewal of this area to have a new playground and everybody was cooperating. We had all kinds of user groups, we had um, images of playing, not of play equipment, but of play activities that they could sticker what they would like or what they wouldn't like. But most important, and I cannot stress this enough, most important is that you cannot be better than your commissioner, in this case the municipality, that really wanted to believe that this could be done. Because I can tell a nice story and say this is, this is how we should do it, and then people start laughing and they buy some equipment somewhere else. So you're never better than the group, you're never better than the municipality and the commissioning party and you, uh, in this particular case, uh, there was also, besides the participation part, a collaboration between architects, landscape architects and, uh, I call myself then, the playground designer that were really willing to mingle everything. If the, the, the, the playground elements are suspended actually from the trellises. Um, there is a part of the playground on one of the rooftops. There is this coffee shop that um, has benches or, front or, or tables in front of it that are public. So they cannot dominate the space. So everyone was working together in this particular situation. Why am I saying this? Because currently I'm working on another project in Amsterdam that looks like this. And everybody is against the parking garage underground and then nothing happens. You can participate what you want and nothing happens so far. Hopefully we, we are able to, to get there somehow. So I'm only saying participation is also about willingness. It is about thinking for other groups. If you are, uh, you're not a parent, but you want, uh, you still should think uh, that is a public space where children play. Let's see what I can contribute to that to say, wouldn't it be nice if children could do this and that, rather than only defending your own area and saying, not in my backyard. So again, there is no tactic, there is no strategy, it's about people. Questions from the audience? We have some mics that will travel around. Thank you very much for this very inspiring uh, presentation. Maybe I can take over from uh, Gregor's. My question was also about how do you approach the locality? I mean, I'm sure even in Amsterdam, from neighborhood to neighborhood, the cultural background and the demographics are so various that each approach, as you said, is a different story. So um, how, how about this incorporation of this locality into it? Like, because you also have lots of international uh, experience abroad. So we, we, we, our major issue in, in the context of Istanbul is the same. So the stratification of cultural differences and then the approach to the, uh, to the public space as a play, uh, place can vary as in the case of Zorlu and then in the suburban uh, regions of Istanbul. So how would you approach to this locality issue? Because it's a very subtle and very complicated, complex issue. Uh, I know there are no very right answers to that, as you mentioned. But maybe you can give a couple of hints to the new designers and to the design educa uh, educators. Thank you. Well, I, I started with telling that we are all um, experienced because we all have been kids. That is, so that is really important. Start thinking about what you like as a kid. That, that, I always tell that because otherwise we start thinking about images of what play playgrounds should look like. 
So that is probably my first story that I would tell. Um, yes, we are working abroad, and that is um, strange, actually. I know nothing about Turkish culture. I know you have very nice food, and the people are generally very friendly, but I, it is already very, very difficult to address all things that are going on in a space that I live very close to. Actually, I live around the corner from the um, from Boninger Plain. Um, so, what shall I say? It, it is. It, it is okay. Um, it's also about trust. I had the opportunity actually to build up this um, uh, this uh, amount of uh, play space. I learned. I, I wasn't afraid to fail. And uh, you know the Zorlu Center, uh, which is a very outstanding playground, probably uh, nothing alike in the world. Uh, you either like it or you hate it. That's what I think. And. Um, uh, but Zorlu trusted us to do this. And if you don't trust your the, the people that are involved, you can never do such a thing because then you are watering down everything. So it's about building trust between groups of people or of stakeholders uh, going to places, show them what is possible or trying to tell why they should look at it differently or trying to bring them back to the neighborhood when they were climbing a tree rather than uh, going up a stair and down a slide with fences next to them so that they cannot fall out. Or, um, uh, well, there's hundreds of ways of, of, of doing this. But again, um, there is no strategy or tactic. It's all about you want something, you believe in it, and you need to understand what is, and that is what you said, uh, the local finesses, the, the, uh, what is the real problem here. Maybe I show with the, the park. Um, we were asked to do a playground. And we said that is not the real, the, the playground is not the real problem. It's about having a space there where children r can reach the playground and where people want to go. So maybe you should first rethink and re-question what is the real question behind the playground. Because um, the, the gentleman uh, uh, at the back standing there told me that there is a saturation of playgrounds in Copenhagen. There is also in Amsterdam. But there's not so many good playgrounds where people would love to go to, where parents would love to go to. Don't, don't limit yourself to the playground. See it as a contribution to, to that space. Um, Ah, that's all I can say. What's next? Of course, we also take questions in Turkish, and I think we can have them translated to Alga. So, please feel free. Thank you, Alga. Okay. Um, how about adventure playgrounds? Have you done any of those? Um, adventure in. Uh, like the ones that are actually kind of completely without any uh, structures, like the, I guess they ah. were started back in uh, Denmark after the war, mm -hmm. and then now again, I think there's one in Wales that was uh, quite famous, I think, with because of our in, uh, documentary. You, you you actually mean like a building playground where you can work with materials? Yes, or, yes, where you um, can build fire and. Yeah. yeah, well, we, we worked on premises that had that, but the, the thing is we didn't work on the building playground itself because that is about having the materials, having the tools, and there is always someone that is guiding that. Uh, so um, we worked uh, on the Rembrandt Park, but there was already one there. Uh, we don't have to do much uh, about that because that's almost like programming. If you mean adventure playgrounds in ad adventurous heights, uh, things that look like they're extremely dangerous. Because believe me, there's two things that kids always, and I, I'm talking about all the kids, what do they want? It should be really dangerous, and your parents shouldn't be able to see you. That are the mo two most important things. Um, uh, how can you design for that with all the standards and rules and uh, scared uh, parents that want to have secure places? 
still you can do many things if you want to. One of the examples is that old mine site. Nobody believes that 65 meters high, one big, that is very adventurous, but that's not what you meant with the adventure playground. Then if we go back to the issue of the standards, I know this is kind of a boring question, but how do you actually deal with new products and getting them approved? Do, do they go through testing or how do you actually get them manufactured? Because this was one of the problems that we had as designers. We, we thought we designed something very cool, but then we couldn't really get it uh, manufactured because none of the playground producers wanted to deal with it. And, then the, and we didn't want to take the risk of working with a kind of a non-playground producer, so... I've got, I've got one sitting there that maybe can give you the answer why they didn't want to produce it. No, that, there's, it's actually two different questions. Uh, very often they don't want to produce it because they want to sell what they have. So that is not to their advantage, unless they want to explore that part of the market. The standard, this is a very... It's good that we have standards. Uh, they're meant to uh, avoid the worst accidents. Um, but we have forgotten about that playing is about learning to deal with risks, uh, learning to deal with what we call calculated risks. And um, uh, how are we dealing with this? I happened to be in the German board in the beginning of the 90s, and um, uh, the German safety board, the, the Deutsche Industrie norm uh, or standard, um, and I learned that it is not by far as strict as the people that are handling the standards. That is the problem. The people that are making the standards try to keep an open end because you cannot make a standard for something that is not there yet. Um, another thing, uh, actually, um, I took it as serious homework to study the standards, to know more about the standards in the background uh, than the people that are actually what we call the security uh, police that is checking the standard. They read, it should not be more than this and that and that. Not approved. Where we say it's about, um, not about following the standard, it's about understanding where that measurement is coming from. I'll give you an example. If you can stick your head in and it gets stuck and it's only 60 centimeters above the floor, you cannot uh, choke yourself because you can always stand on the floor, even a child. But the, the engineer that is checking that is only measuring and saying, hey, it's uh, 20 centimeters, it's not okay, not approved. So you really need to know more about it than they do. And then there is something what we call safety in a different way. But again, you need to have this build up knowledge because otherwise you cannot get this across. Uh, safety in another way is, uh, we always use the Dutch example um, uh, where if you go to certain countries and there is a, a pond or a lake, there's always a fence around it because otherwise children might drown. Uh, uh, another way is uh, we have almost obligatory uh, swimming lessons from four years old on in the Netherlands so all children can swim. That's another way of dealing with the issue where, again, the standard is not telling you how you should deal with it. It says if you do it like this, it's okay, but it doesn't say that you cannot do it in a different way. You only need to have this specialist safety inspector following you and approving it. And there you need a lot of, uh, as I said, build-up knowledge to get that approved. Again, I give you the example of the mine uh, hill, 65 meters high, Basically, you can roll down all the way from, from the hill, and still we could get that improved, uh, uh, approved. Uh, took us quite a while, but we, we, we managed. So, uh, uh, do your homework <laughs> and, and outsmart. <laughs> I think the main, maybe the main issue is, uh, at least in Istanbul or in our country, uh, we talk about children play parks. I don't know how I can translate it to English better. Uh, this means uh, we are talking about a space where we have to fit in with certain equipment so that children can play there. When the focus is this, I mean when the approach is like this, 
then you start thinking of, well, what can I put in this park to uh, make children, satisfy children for physical play, for social play, or for this or that type of uh, play. And then it comes up to, you know, designing, you know, very uh, complex uh, or, I mean, very artificial uh, units. Uh, but I think we should uh, put the issue like we have to uh, provide spaces for uh, where play is also possible or where children can play. I mean, not uh, parks for children to play, but open spaces, open areas where play is also possible. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's, it's nice to hear that you agree. Uh, but but I, I think this is an important issue uh, for us uh, to rethink this it, it issue. Is, it is all us designers that should advocate this, isn't it? Also the case and not follow what we think is a playground. We try to spread that and say it can be done better. Uh, çok teşekkür ediyorum. Uh, Murat Ermeydan Peyzaj Mark. Can you uh, after uh, you have finished your question, can you then translate it for me? No? Oh, okay. Then <gülüyor> try to understand. Okay. Okay. Çok teşekkür ediyorum. Çok keyifli bir sunumdu. Peyzaj Mark'ları da sonra katılıyoruz. Yaptıkları projelerde, tasarımlarda geri bildirimi nasıl alıyor? Takip ediyor anladığım kadarıyla sunulan projelerini. Geri bildirimleri e, nasıl projeye yeni projelere nasıl aktarıyor? Nice question. <gülüyor> um, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. If we do a project, um, uh, let's say here in Istanbul, in Zorlu. We don't get much information about it, and I'm not here every day to see what happened, how it has changed, etc. Um, in Amsterdam, on my bicycle, I very often pass through uh, the projects that we have done, or people even call and say, "Hey, uh, have you noticed that this and that, and so and so?" Uh, so it it is. Um, we were in our studio. We were actually thinking about that we should do a tour uh, around all the projects we did in Amsterdam to see what they look like. For instance, after 10 years, one of the complaints we had, uh, or actually, um, I should say, preconceptions that they were hard to maintain, uh, where standard equipment shouldn't. Uh, so we should make the tour, see if that is true. Um, uh, but there is no not not a set way that we follow up. Very often it depends on either the the client or people that make use of it, what they tell us, and if we think that we need to go somewhere, and then we of course incorporate that experience in in, in new projects. From the user perspective, I give you the example of the Van Beuninger plan. Um, that works really well. But we seldom hear from the project that don't work really well because people don't call us. They have no idea. So there's also a very strange thing. It's like uh, the benches in a park. If nobody sits there, they stay good forever. And everybody thinks this is a good bench. That's a little bit of the pro problem. We do get information when uh, people think that um, certain places need a lot of maintenance and very often that we, we, we do go there and have a look and then we discover that it's being used so frequently. If you use something very often, it also deteriorates, it's wear and tear. So we get bits and pieces of information in, uh, learning by doing, experiencing over the years, but it's not like a, a, a fast way of dealing with it. We always go check after one year, after three years, after five years, it totally depends. I, I was invited to go to Zorlu. <laughs> Herkese selamlar.
Arif Irgı ismim. Zorlu Center, Zorlu Gayrimenkul Peyzaj Sorumlusuyum. Elgar Bey, hoş geldiniz öncelikle İstanbul'a, Türkiye'ye. Geri bildirim anlamında ve 5 dakikanızı alarak Zorlu Center'daki çocuk oyun alanının, oyun grubunun imalat süreci hakkında birkaç bildirimde bulunmak isterim sizlere. Öncelikle ülkemize ve İstanbul'a böyle bir oyun alanı, oyun grubu kattığınız için çok teşekkür ederiz. Hakikaten dünya çapında insanlar, dünya çapında mimarlar, peyzaj mimarları, firmalar alanımızı ziyaret ederek hayranlıkla izliyorlar, geziyorlar ve teşekkürlerini sunuyorlar. Hem ülkemize hem böyle bir oyun alanı kattığımız için ben de onların babında size tekrar teşekkürlerimizi sunuyorum. İmalata başladığımızda koca koca beton duvarlar yapmaya başladık. E, Tabi projeleri var, detayları var. Biz bunları okuyabiliyoruz, görebiliyoruz. Sonuçta ne çıkacağını görüyoruz ancak kalıpları çakan arkadaşlar, betonları döken arkadaşlar biz buraya bir gece kondu mu yapmaya başladık acaba? Yeni bir bina mı dikeceğiz diye yorumlamaya başladılar. Tabii imalat bittiğinde, imalat bittiğinde çok daha farklı bir şey çıktı ortaya. Hepiniz biliyorsunuz, hepiniz gördünüz. O duvarların arasında gezinen, koşturan, saklambaç oynayan, bir yerlere ulaşan çocuklar, kulelere tırmanmalar, yani çok ciddi bir eğlenceli alan oluştu. Müthiş bir tasarımdı, müthiş bir deneyimdi ve özellikle şunu da söylemek istiyorum. Kulelerin imalatında imalatı yapan arkadaşlar... 30-40 yaşında işçi arkadaşlardan bahsediyorum. O metal kaydıraktan kayarak imalatın sonunda zemine inmeleri, öğlen yemeği ya da akşam mesai bitiminde onlar için inanılmaz bir tecrübeydi, inanılmaz bir deneyimdi. Bunu da ifade etmek isterim. Şimdi oyun alanının şu anki durumuna gelecek olursak da bir kullanım haricinde her şey yerli yerinde duruyor. E, meyilli alanda e, beton kaydırağın olduğu alandaki spinnerlarımızı sökmek zorunda kaldık. Çünkü o spinnerlardaki birçok çocuğun düşerek e, yaralanabilme ihtimali e, ve başımıza gelmesi maalesef onları kaldırmak zorunda kaldık. Onun dışında tüm imalatlarınız, tüm tasarımınız çok güzel bir şekilde, sağlıklı bir şekilde kullanılıyor, yerinde duruyor. E, Ufak tefek yaralanmalar, ufak tefek kazalar oluyor ama bin kişi içerisinde bir kişi belki bunları yaşıyor. E tabi deformasyonlar oluyor. Gerek epidemde gerek beton kaydırağın boyalarında deformasyonlar oluyor. Tüm peyzaj imalatlarında olduğu gibi bu çocuk oyun alanında da gerek beton boyalarında gerek ahşap imalatlarda bakımları yaparak tasarımınızı, eserinizi yaşatmaya çalışıyoruz. Yaşatarak da devam edeceğiz. Tekrar çok teşekkür ederim. Thank you. Did you understand? Okay. So that's how long it's heavily, heavily used every day. Isn't that true? So there is always wear and tear things going on. And uh, yeah, okay. One last question from the from the room. Yes. Uh, you talked about your clients actually as municipalities or like shopping malls and so on, but the, the end user is the, the children and you don't really get to talk to your client most of the time probably during the, you know, business time. So after 20 years of experience, what would you say is the biggest challenge to have kids as your final client? Good question. They're the easiest clients you can have because they're always happy and always surprised. It's always the parents that are complaining. <laughs> so uh, I've never showed an image to them and they said, no, no, this is what we don't want. <laughs> so uh, I think they, they, they all talk about it and all like it and uh, uh, yeah, they are my best clients. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very thank much for coming. Thank you for having me. <laughs>